So without you, it would have never happened. And a lot of people don't realize that. They're just like, oh, this footage, you know, you guys just got lucky and this footage just fell in your lap. It didn't fall in anybody's lap. You made it happen back then. Then everybody forgot about it. And then all of a sudden you had it again. And then it languished for another five or 10 years, right? Uh, uh, and uh, I'm just really glad I asked you on that day if there was anything I could do to make a crime movie. It was meant to be. Yeah. Uh, and, and what's some of the other footage that you mixed in with it? Well, there's the Super 8 footage that his wife shot at, at uh, San Quentin. So Crime played a very famous show at San Quentin uh, that year. And um, uh, there is a, a full Target video of that somewhere um, in Los Angeles, possibly, who knows, um, that uh, still has never been seen. Uh, in today's age, it was released on VHS like like maybe 50 copies or something, but nobody has a single copy of it. The other footage was like rehearsals, uh, and uh, and what else is in there? It's just it's all from that time. Larry came and did some B rolls. Obviously, there's a ton of B roll in there. There's the main show from June 4th or June 24th, and we can't really figure it out. Uh, and uh, and that's kind of it. Like there, it's not, it's not a lot, and it's all sixteen millimeter. Yeah, except for the super eight footage from the video. And like a lot of folks make good films, looking back at the past, they find old footage, they bring it. But so many people will do a lot of new interviews and a lot of voiceover and have to tell you every single thing. You decidedly did not do that. And did you have the sort of discussions like this is going to be a film that represents the band? How did that? Was there actually a discussion about how to do that? Yeah. <clears throat> we did have that discussion, and um, the decision was made to keep it pure, to keep it all from you know the archive, and not uh, attempt to contextualize it. Yeah, my original dream was my original dream was to um, do a crime documentary, like a full length crime documentary. And when when we saw this footage, we're just like, no, this is it. They, they don't need you know. I would like to do a full-length crime documentary someday, but this isn't it, you know. When the money shows up, yeah, see, see, it's not going to happen. Because <laughs> I told people about the existence of this footage for years. You know, every time a record uh, reissue or something would come out, I would say, oh, we got this footage. Nobody was ever interested enough to finish it, so ended up doing it ourselves. Yeah, and, and was there, of course, everyone's going to wonder if there was a lot more footage or, because growing up, I grew up in a tiny town, late 70s, early 80s, and it's impossible to see anything. Like, you needed this proof of existence. There's just not much, for as impactful as these bands have been, there's just not that much footage that exists. Did you actually have stuff you didn't use or stuff you wish you could have used? No, this was it. This was all the footage. There's some other, <laughs> from, from this, from this, there, there's no other footage that we know of uh, uh, from this time period, from that shoot, there, there's nothing. Uh, but there are cuts that aren't, you know, there's five cameras going for 11 minutes. So there's angles and cuts that are, you know, obscured by, by the editing. Um, so I guess there is footage that hasn't been used, but it's only, it's only of alternate camera angles, yeah. And for those of us too young to go to the Mav during that time, how would you describe this this place and its its uh, unique person in charge? Ah, uh, well, <laughs> it was a uh, dirt kind of a shithole. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that pretty much comes through pretty clearly. Um, it was a pretty marginal place to play. The stage was only, you know, a, a foot or two off the ground. And uh, it was very cramped quarters, um, a very uh, inadequate uh, green room upstairs, <laughs> these, uh, these rickety stairs. Um, Frankie always um, liked to uh, urinate before going on stage, and uh, there was no bathroom um, in the dressing room. So he went into a closet and uh, would just urinate on the floor. The closet in the dressing room was directly over the bar. So the urine was dripping down no. on the bar. The bartender would come up screaming 
uh, because the urine was pouring all over the place. So that's uh, that's the kind of place in the book. That's the first time I heard about that part. And did Dirk just love this scene, or it feels like such a natural sort of thing that came together with these bands in this place? Yeah, Dirk was a force of nature. He uh, um, was uh, he's I think the uh, nephew of Senator. Uh, Dirksen, famous uh, U.S. Senator. Um, he uh, had a checkered past, but he seized this moment and talked uh, Nessa Kino, the, uh, the, the Filipino nightclub owner, to, into letting him take the late night section and just program it. And he ran with it and a great character. And uh, we became actually very good, very, very close friends. Um, after crime and after the punk scene, he continued to support me in all kinds of ways. He would always show up at uh, premieres of my films and always wish me well. And we talked about um, doing something with his archive, which is he has this mysterious video archive um, that um, never came to fruition. But um, the, the cool thing about Dirk is that um, we're going to spend eternity together. Uh, right before uh, COVID, uh, I was able to secure the last niche in uh, the San Francisco Columbarium, a historic uh, institution. And uh, Dirk is uh, is there, and I'll be just uh, up the stairs and one floor up, and uh, he can uh, harangue me for for till the end of time. Are you are you going to urinate? <laughs> Just goes only rock and roll here, because it seems like I mean now we all look on it, and especially all the you know so we see so much archive footage. And we're like, wow, what a great moment! But it also did seem like there were that many to play, places to play. Was it that easy to keep this scene alive to get places? Did, was there that many venues? How did you feel at the time? Well, it was a uh, very difficult uh, because uh, Bill Graham, who you know I sort of had a lock on the city and its major venues, uh, proclaimed very early in the punk scene that no punk band would ever play a Bill Graham venue. So that immediately excluded uh, all the mainstream venues. So uh, we, as the Wabuhai caught on, and Crime was, of course, one of the very earliest bands there, you know, the, the field got more crowded because these bands were popping up fast. And um, and so we found ourselves having to you know fight for Friday and Saturday nights where we had you know often been given them in the past uh, freely. So we made an attempt to expand the punk scene into other venues. And we we I believe were the first punk band to play the boarding house, which was kind of a mid level venue, and, but a much more mainstream one. And um, and then we uh, made our most audacious move when. For Halloween of 1978, uh, we decided to rent Bimbo's, which is um, one of the uh, classiest venues in San Francisco, <laughs> and uh, and have a Halloween show. And to ensure our success, we invited our favorite band from LA at the time, the Weirdos, to come up and uh, co-headline with us. And we thought that would just be a uh, a wonderful thing. Um, however, our efforts were thwarted somewhat because um, the day of the show and when we had uh, rented our sound system to be brought in and everything to be set up, uh, we were told we could not have access to the venue because Philip Kaufman was in the alley next door to Bimbo's filming Invasion of Body Snatchers. <laughs> and I was the guy who had to go up to him and screaming. Because they ran late, of course, like all movies do, and they were blocking the entrance to the venue. So I was the guy who had to go up to Phil Kaufman, and I was so furious, I said to him, it'll never be as good as the original. <laughs> and you know what? It isn't. <laughs> the best part about this story is I don't think Amanda knew that story before she booked these two films together. <laughs> Just blocking you forever. <laughs> um, People love to book these two films together all of a sudden. They don't know why, because they're in the 1978 San Francisco connection. 
<laughs> it's happened a couple times already, just independent, like, so I don't know, I don't know why or how. <laughs> For those of us slightly younger, um, when I see this footage, not having been there and, like, wishing I was, like, I am just, I'm surprised. This is, like, before there was a dress code. Like, this is, like, a true group of weirdos coming together. How did you feel looking through all this footage, maybe not even knowing, maybe seeing an occasional face you knew, but mostly strangers? And, yeah, mostly strangers. Uh, um, I was excited to see uh, a few familiar faces from the scene. Uh, Ginger Coyote uh, plays a lot in it. And then uh, Bambi. Uh, what was Bambi? Bambi Lake. Yeah, Bambi Lake, who just uh, passed recently. Rest in peace. Um I was pretty shocked to see how uh, diverse the scene was. Um, the crowd was like, and, and a lot of people, like when you're watching, you're like, you just are expecting to see just punks. You know, you're not, you're not ready to see this weird, uh, hip, like leftover hippie crossover, lost style, just weird fashions that like don't make any sense and are just crisscrossing. You know, it's great. It's just, and that's what it, like, that's the, that's what is supposed to be cool about punk is that everybody could just, like, come as they are and be themselves uh, before there was a dress code enforced to be a punk, you know? So I thought that was awesome. Like, I was really pleased with all of the, with all the different kinds of faces and the the diversity involved uh, 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 in in the crowds, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you, you, you say 1978, and this is when this happened, but does that year hold something special for you? Um, you know, a lot of these shows, there's the Ramones play at Savoy Tivoli in 1976, and August is supposedly that's when a lot of, one of those shows where a bunch of people went, saw the show, created a band. Well, does that make 78 kind of the peak of this, or how do you feel about that? Well, 78 was kind of the peak of crime, I think. Um, you know, it's the year of the San Quentin show, which got us the greatest piece of press we ever got. We got our picture in the Weekly World News. And uh, I'm more proud of that than, than any any press I ever got. Um, I'm still like, isn't this weird? These guys in cop uniforms played in San Quentin? <laughs> yes, yes, it is weird. It's weird. But it was, a, you know, that was the year we kind of hit our stride, you know. Um, I joined in 77, and uh, when I joined, I didn't play drums. I didn't know how to play drums. And uh, I never really did learn. Um, I'm probably the worst drummer ever to become known for playing the drums. But I wanted the loudest, right? I wanted to be in the band. That's all I knew. And they and um, the show where I saw crime the first time at the Mabuhai, uh, by accident, um, I was just I thought this is it. Everything I love is here on the stage. And Dirk came out at the end of that show and said, crime needs a drummer. (laughs) And I decided in that moment, I'm going to be that drummer. (laughs) And I contacted the band and made my case. And they said, you're in. So I went out and got some drums. And our first show was in two weeks. And crime was the headlining band at that point. So I joined a headlining band, had two weeks to learn how to play the drums and learn the set. And, um, you know. I did my best. That's all I can say. We have some time for a couple of questions from the audience. Should they just scream? Oh, there's a microphone. I mean, you can't get. Who wants to talk in a microphone? Yeah. That guy with long hair. <laughs> kind of looks like a hippie, I, and I know he used to live in the Bay Area. Go ahead. I got to ask what kind of movie was Larry going to make? I'm totally like five cameras. It sounds amazing. Like I'm totally blown away by the audio on this. Like, so the interviews, like, did you know like what film he was gonna? He make? he only had a vague idea of what he wanted to do. He wanted to call the movie "Punk Is Dot Dot Dot." <laughs> so he was just, you know, he didn't know anything about the scene. He wasn't part of the scene. He was only there because we were friends. So he's just learning it as he's filming it, and I think he his plan was to go back there again and film other bands and kind of put it together and do a thing, but... God, he ran out of steam so fast. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. It was a very ambitious project, especially shooting 16 millimeter film. And he enlisted some of the local, some of the scenesters to uh, to handle the, the bolexes. There were three bolexes. 
running around wild. And uh, so it was a good start, but that's as far as it got. Well, the sound was recorded off of the board, and it happens to be a great recording, you know. I mean, it was, yeah. without the sound, it would have been a tough going. All, all the music came from one reel-to-reel -reel tape, okay, that was recorded off the board that, on the one night where the, all the sync sound. Whenever you see them singing and the sync is perfect, that is the sync sound, right? For it, and, and that's... And it's uh, it's 23 minutes of audio that goes with 11 minutes of footage, and so I had to expand that to 35 minutes with all the other footage. But the sound on that reel to reel tape was awesome. Yeah. So it was mixed to stereo. Yeah. So that's what we yeah. got. Yeah. And uh, my son did some, did the sound design and enhanced it and turned it into a 5.1 mix and you know kind of fleshed out the sound design. It was very lucky, though, to have that audio, because it was not part of the, like, it was a t in a tape, on a tape in a different box, and it was not with the footage, and it was a very lucky find that we were able to marry and find and find the, uh, the actual music, and that it sounded as good as it did. Right here in the front. How many albums did Crime make? How many albums did Crime make? <laughs> <laughs> Whether or not it's when the band existed or not. Yeah, right. So there's, 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 you know, when crime was crime, the answer is zero. <laughs> crime was, crime is credited with being the first punk band on the West Coast because, and they can make claim to that, because they released the first single, first self-produced DIY single. Um, so that cemented their place in history. But um, in terms of albums, there are quite a few uh, that have come out um, subsequently. There's a complete uh, studio recording album. Uh, San Francisco's Doomed is a live recording. Um, half live, half studio uh, that uh, has just been reissued for the fourth time. So um, these are still available. And um, You'll have to consult the discography for all the singles and bootlegs and all that stuff. And also, isn't isn't early seventy eight when the Sex Pistols played Witherland? January seventy eight. It is Sex Pistols are uh, Great question. I say crime was asked to play uh, on that bill with the Sex Pistols, <laughs> and uh, we were um, ready to do it, uh, but then uh, because of a billing issue. Um, we um, uh, opted out of the show. <laughs> what kind of billing issue? Like your name? Oh, oh. Uh, crime, we, we, crime considered itself a headlining Great follow-up question. Yeah. Great what kind follow-up question. question. The question was... So what was there were the bands, issue? like the, all the bands that were in the first film, in the red, those were all the bands that opened for us. We would never open for any of those bands. <laughs> they had to open for us. And when it came time uh, for the Sex Pistols show, um, somehow the Avengers management had made contact with the Sex Pistols management and gotten in there, and they secured the second bill slot. So it would have been crime opening, the Avengers second, and then the Sex Pistols. Now, crime always said we would only ever open for two bands, the Ramones, which we did, and the Sex Pistols. So we were ready to do it. But we said, we will not open for the, for the Avengers. We won't do it. So, uh, and they wouldn't budge. So we're like, okay, give it to the nuns. And we laughed and laughed and laughed that the nuns opened for the Avengers. That was a big deal. Did you regret it? I don't regret it. <laughs> the, punk, the punk answer. What do you think he's going to say? Well, the question right here in the middle. Oh, can we use a mic? Well, I'll use a microphone so everybody can hear. And... Well, they're also recording it, so yeah, sorry. This is a bootleg recording, so we need to get this on the on air. There's the spirit of Dirk in us. You mentioned Dirk's archive. I heard that he lost all his videos in a fire. Are there still some that didn't get burned because oh, well. he filmed every night at the map? So. Well, actually, he didn't film every night at the map. Um, Dirk's archive and. 
I do know that there was a fire. I don't know how much was destroyed. I don't know how much was there, but I'll tell you this. Um, Dirk started filming more at the On Broadway, which was the venue upstairs that opened later, in the later days of the map. It was a much larger sort of auditorium. And um, his, his crew was set up up there. And this archive was very mysterious, but I did get to see some of it. And it was all unwatchable and unusable. It was one camera set up in the balcony showing the whole stage and what can you do with that you know badly recorded sound and it wasn't much of an archive but he had hundreds of tapes <laughs> <laughs> nothing nothing was ever done with them to my knowledge i have one more okay. one more punk one right here <laughs> not to put the pressure on That was an amazing film, by the way. That's super cool. All right, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank so you. I was curious if you guys, as Prime, ever performed in a rockabilly venue, since that was one of the influences. I don't know if there was even a rockabilly scene, really, in San Francisco at the time. <clears throat> so, yeah, we were, uh, you know, we, we were rockabilly friendly. Um, there were no, there were not rockabilly venues at that time because at that time, the rockabilly scene blended seamlessly with the punk scene. Um, so rockabilly bands played the map on a fairly regular basis, but there was no dedicated rockabilly venue in the Bay Area that I was aware of, and it would have been unlikely that they would have welcomed crime. So. Uh, did, did any band try to fight you because you were so stringent about being the first and only rock and roll band? Did that start before you? We didn't get in any fights. We, we, we uh, avoided that. We were considered too threatening to, uh, to, to approach. Maybe it's all that fake cocaine in the film <laughs> that, you're, that you're doing. That was not the band doing the cocaine. Those were the fans. <laughs> There's a menacing, very direct shot. Wait, wait, wait for the wait for the bootleg microphone. The bootleg recording of the microphone. We got to release this. To address the menacing aspect of the image of crime, there's an incredible shot early in the film where the band is walking. It's very direct and it's lit, and it, someone is directing this band to be menacing. Yeah. And there's a side angle and a frontal. You're you're focused twice. It's probably the most menacing I've ever seen you. Did you who's directing this? Is this Dirk? No, no, no. That would have been Larry. Oh, Larry, sorry. Larry. Larry, Larry was directing, and Larry was in control, and Larry had some ideas about things he wanted to do, and walking into the, the map was, you know, one of his high concepts. And Frankie sneering and lip things, is that also directed, or is that, like, how everyone just... Acted. Uh, yeah, that's just how we were in those days. <laughs> <laughs> We've got to wrap it up, but you have. Yeah, no, we got to. Okay, we have to wrap it, but no, uh, you have some other things to plug. I have a good that are question now. Yeah. All right, we got. Okay. Uh, I'll just plug a couple things here. Um, in on October twelfth, we're going to be showing this film again at Zebulon as part of uh, the Cretan Hop, but we're. We're going to have added features. We're going to have um, the Crime Tribute Band, Crime Wave, is going to be performing. And they are great. They are great. Including one of the members is the son of one of the Dills, uh, one of the Kinmans. So uh, there's, a, there's a real uh, uh, connection there. And then um, uh, we have, uh, and then at the end of this month in San Diego, uh, we'll be showing the film again as part of the 40th anniversary celebration of Ugly Things Magazine, which uh, is going to be a three-day weekend freakout that uh, should be a lot of fun. So you might want to tool down there. And, um, uh, and this film's available, too, for those who want to buy it. Oh, this film the uh, was released, a limited release on DVD uh, with a soundtrack album, but um, those are long gone. And uh, but the film can be viewed if you 
those of you who uh, want to show it to other people who didn't make it tonight, it's uh, it's on our website, so it's easily streamable. Crime uh, SF. Cri yeah, crimesf.com. So there you go. Uh, this scene just was didn't last that long, and images of it are very important to us for those of us who lived through the fucking Reaganomic 80s. These sort of bands and music saved our lives. So, so happy these films could be seen. Thank you guys for saving these films and making something out of it. Thanks everyone for coming. We're gonna have a short break. Okay. Thanks Mike, thanks Amanda, thank you very much. And then, and then Henry Rosenthal presents Invasion of the Body Snatchers.